Hi, I'm Tammy Fontana from All in the Family Counseling Center, Private Limited. And this is our World For You um, talk that I'm having today with Dr. Marty Klein from California. And I'm so happy to have him that he's sharing with us his wisdom and insight around some key topics that we're gonna be discussing today. I just wanted to take a moment, and Dr. Klein, for those of you, for those people who don't know you, can you just give us a short summary of who you are? And thank you again so much for joining us. Tammy, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as you say, I'm a therapist in California for 35 years. I've been a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified sex therapist. I've written seven books about relationships and sexuality. And I train a lot of therapists, as you know, all over the world, not just in the USA. And I do some work uh, for the court system when they need an expert about sex and um, I train a lot of physicians because they don't get a lot of training in sexuality at all. And, um, oh, and I should mention my blog, right? Well, we'll talk about that later. So I'm glad to be here, and um, I wish the circumstances were a little different, but I really want to support what you're doing with World for You. So uh, I'm ready for whatever question you're going to start with. Thank you, Dr. Klein. Um, oh, you got to call me Marty. Call me Marty, okay? Okay, Marty. Um, okay. So thank you so much. Well, because you're, you're, you have, as you said, 35 years, and I think what people need now in this time of uncertainty and ambiguity is wisdom and guidance. And, you know, the whole premise behind World for You is we want to, as therapists, give back. And, you know, we, unlike the doctors who are healing bodies, we, we heal minds, we heal souls, and we heal relationships. And so I'm going to be focusing more on some existential issues that I see my clients facing, and I'm sure clients that you're dealing with. Um, one of the things I'd be interested, what are you telling patients when they are dealing with uh, the loss or a sense of safety? Huh. Let's really get down to the hard questions first, okay? Um, well, you know, as we go from being children, when we're actually not entirely safe because we're so dependent, to being teenagers where we like to believe we're safe, but we're still not entirely safe, to adulthood where we're really in charge of our own sense of safety. Uh, the, the task of establishing a sense of safety is a lifelong task. Starts in childhood and it's a lifelong task. How are you gonna feel safe? And as we get older, the challenges change, um, but the task remains the same. How am I gonna feel safe? And how am I gonna feel safe in an uncertain world? Because I don't know if anybody remembers before the virus, such a long time ago, but there was a lot of uncertainty before the virus, remember? There was a lot of uncertainty, whether it was about our jobs, whether it's about our, our marriages or our kids or our health or the health of the people we love. There was a lot of uncertainty. But because most of us, had a routine, we were able to feel much more comfortable with the uncertainty. One of the issues that we're all facing with the virus now is that we've been pushed out of our familiar routines. I don't know if our viewers know just how much you love to exercise, Tammy, um, but you've really, I'm imagining, I haven't even asked you, you've really had your exercise routine changed, right? And I've had my work routine changed. We've all had our routines about raising our kids changed, and even what do we eat? Because we, a lot of us can't depend on getting fresh produce every day now. So yes, the world has changed. The developmental challenge has not changed. How do you feel safe in an uncertain world? And for some people, they just use a lot of denial. <laughs> um, it works in the short run, not very good in the long run. So some people use denial. Some people drink too much. That's their way of dealing with an uncertain world. Some people, they pick a lot of fights with the people they live with. That's their way of dealing with their anxiety about living in an uncertain world. Um, I think it helps to remember who you are, and it helps to remember what your values are. And... For those of us who can't use the same old ways of knowing who we are, we have to find new ways. So if, if 
if your way of knowing who you are is by being um, active outside all the time, skiing in the winter and uh, bicycling and running and doing all that stuff, and now you can't do that, okay. What are you gonna do on a regular basis that's available to you right now with the lockdown that makes you feel, yeah, I'm being me, that reminds you, yeah, this is who I am. Maybe it involves reading, maybe it involves reaching out to somebody who's, um, who's a shut-in, maybe it involves a new kind of conversation with the people we, uh, we care about or dealing with your kids um, in a more focused way. So I think that's one tool that people can use to get through this version of uncertainty, which is to find ways of remembering who you are. That's really wonderful. Yeah, to remember who you are. And, and I think um, if you're uncertain about who you are, because I know that's one of the tasks that I'm often helping clients work on, you know, this is something then to reach out um, for a therapist or somebody to, to discover who you are. Because yeah, crises often reveal sides of us uh, that weren't there or that we don't know about. So I think that's a, a wonderful way to do it. Uh, do you have any guidance for people if, they don't, if they're struggling with knowing who they are, you know, once they've taken away the denial or the drinking? That's, or that's a great things? question, Tammy. And I, I find that for a lot of people, music is a really good vehicle for that. You know, most of us at the very least, we remember the music that was popular when we were 17 years old. Now, we're not, most of us are not 17 anymore. But at the very least, if you listen to a little bit of music from a period in your life when you were happy or when you were engaged with the world or when you felt optimistic or when you felt um, you have a lot ahead of you to look forward to, I think that's a good reminder. That said, I don't think we should only listen to the music that was popular when we were 17. Um, I, I am quite devoted to music and, and I'm always encouraging people to find music that they enjoy listening to. And then uh, I ask my patients, okay, whatever music you like, it doesn't have to be what I like, but whatever music you like, like what do you like about that? And how does it make you feel? You know, what you think about it is totally different than how you feel about it. So how do you feel when you listen to this music? For some people, you know, they just can't help moving their bodies when they're listening to music, and that's a great thing. And for other people, they listen to a, a sad song or a happy song, either way, and they feel, yeah, that person understands how I feel. Whether it's feeling bad or feeling good, everybody likes to feel like they're not the only one. Everybody likes to feel connected, whether they feel bad or good. So if there's music that expresses a feeling or that expresses a mood that somebody can relate to, I think that's a, gr a great way of not feeling alone, of being reminded, oh, this is who I am, of feeling um, a little bit more uh, powerful in facing uncertainty. So I think music is a, is a great tool for that. And by the way, I think that every one of the arts can serve that function. And most people don't like every single one of the arts. I know I don't. I don't like ballet. I don't like opera. A lot of shrieking. I don't like ballet or opera or modern dance, but I love, love, love cinema. So again, um, when, I'm, when I'm watching cinema, um, I'm able to relate to characters and say, yeah, I definitely know how that guy feels. Or, huh, so I'm not the only one who feels, say, unattractive. Or I'm not the only one who feels everybody else is in better shape than I am, or whatever it is. And I think that the great thing about the arts, and I don't mean this in some highfalutin way, I mean any kind of artistic expression, the great thing about it is that People can pick an art form, whether it's cinema, whether it's painting, whatever it is, and have a relationship with the people who create the art that you like. So in the world of cinema, for example, I feel like I'm 
in a 50 year relationship with Alfred Hitchcock. Now he's dead now, but his films live. So with music, I feel I've been in a relationship with David Bowie for 30 years. I feel like I've been in a relationship with Jimi Hendrix since 1968. And people can like different kinds of cinema. People can like different kinds of music or paintings or whatever it is. Find, um, find an artist of whatever the medium, find an artist and connect with that artist and be curious about what that artist has to say about human feelings, about human experiences. Yeah, I love that. I know in, in our past discussions, you had talked to me about that. And my, my preferred is uh, poetry because poetry mm -hmm. um, captures expression and feelings and, uh, and it really can touch you and move you and, and capture things. And I think that's great about developing a relationship and helping us to remember who we are or find, find different modes to remind us of who we are if, if that's something that's a bit lost right now. Um, uh -huh. I want to, unless you have something before, else to add. Before, before you leave that, before you leave that, poetry is such a good example. Now, I'm going to confess, I hope this doesn't change your opinion about me, Tammy. I'm not a big poetry fan, I got to admit. I also understand that poetry can really resonate for people, and that's great. Um, when we talk about remembering who you are, you could read a poem, and it might be about something totally not your experience, but you could be touched by it because of the skill of the poet in evoking um, someone else's experience. And when we, when we get touched by a poet or a musician, say a poet, when we get touched by a poet's description of sadness or a poet's description of childbirth or a poet's description of loss or whatever it is, even if it's not your experience, when we get touched, we get to say to ourselves, yeah, this is who I am. I can be touched. I can be touched by a poem. Isn't that glorious? And I think what you're saying, too, it's really nice that, and, and what we really need to be reminded of is, is the need to be connected with everybody, especially now this mm -hmm. COVID is such a socially isolating um, Disease. virus disease and and people were social beings and so i think again it's how do we stay connected in one shape or form whether it's through the arts mm -hmm. whether it's through video mm -hmm. calls uh whether it's mm -hmm. volunteering or donating but the, the connection is also so important in just how you do it mm -hmm. um I, I want it to shift a little bit just being in mind of, of the time because i'm so grateful for the the um time that you're giving to this is another kind of existential theme i'm seeing people deal with is powerlessness um you know the powerlessness coming from the inability to move the powerlessness i have a lot of clients whose families are in other countries that they're no longer able to travel to what kind of guidance um or framework are you giving your patients to deal with the powerlessness that they may be feeling or experiencing in their life in, in this post-covid world Boy, that really is the, the question of the hour, isn't it? And you framed it so nicely, Tammy. Um, let's, let's back up a half a step. Before we talk about powerlessness, I want to talk about autonomy. You know, children, <clears throat> children are dependent on their adult caregivers, and some of us have better adult care, caregivers than others. In adolescents, they dream of autonomy, and young adults, they go out there and they enjoy their autonomy and um, they always overestimate how much they have, but okay. And as people go through adulthood, we kind of establish um, an understanding of how much autonomy is reasonable to expect today and tomorrow. So whether it's how easily it is to move around our world geographically, um, whether it's um, how much autonomy I have to express myself in a relationship, whether it's how much autonomy I have about deciding how I want to spend my money, how much I want to spend, when I'm going to spend it, um, how I'm going to spend it. E every adult comes to um, take for granted how much autonomy they have. And in different cult countries, in different cultures, in different um, income levels, the people experience different levels of autonomy, 
But no matter how much autonomy, emotional autonomy, or uh, uh, social autonomy people have, they come to take it for granted. It's one of the great luxuries of adulthood. Six-year-olds, they never know when the next time they're going to hear the word no is coming. It could be in the next five minutes. They're minding their own business. All they do, you know, they do something and somebody says no. And that's the end of their autonomy for that moment. With us, we generally have a sense of what we're going to be able to do. Well, welcome to a new world where that's no longer true. There are so many ways that we've all overnight lost significant parts of our autonomy. You can't even go down the street and get a cup of coffee. You can't even go over to your best friend's house and hug them. You can't even buy certain things because Amazon's not delivering everything right now. There's so much. You can't even have sex with people you don't live with right now. So we all lost so much of our autonomy overnight. And I think that's part of what everybody is having so much trouble with. Now that's the context that people have lost their own personal autonomy and now ask the question about how are people going to deal with their powerlessness or their, their sense of powerlessness about family members who are over there or coworkers who are over there. Um, and I think that, that background, I think, makes it a much more um, profound question. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, this is going to be an exercise for every single one of us in deciding which things we can't control, which things we yearn to control and cannot control. At the end of the day, there is a limit to how much we can control the people we love, even for their own good, even to say, I know what's good for your safety better than you do. It's not just, I know better how you should spend your money. No, no, no. I'm talking about something much more important than that. I'm not talking about what dress you should wear or whether or not those shoes look good on you. No, I'm talking about something really important here. I seem to know something about what's good for your health that you don't seem to understand. You really must do it my way. And our loved ones who are grown-ups, they're going to do what they're going to do. And it's our grief to stand by and watch them put their health at risk. And we can be as persuasive as we like. We can be as charming. We can even be as manipulative as we like. At the end of the day, there is a limit to how much we can control the people we love, particularly if we don't live in the same house. <laughs> there is a limit to how much we can control the people we love, even when it's about serious matters of health and safety. And that was true before the virus. Ask anybody with a teenager. There is a limit to how much you can control a teenager. Ask anybody with a spouse. There's a limit to how much you can control your spouse. Ask anybody before the virus with an aging parent. There's a limit to how much you can influence an aging parent. And that's before the virus. And most of us don't like that aspect of love. Most of us don't like that. Wait, 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 let me get this straight. I'm going to love you more and more and more but I'm still not going to be able to control you no matter what I do. Hmm. I don't know. That doesn't sound like a very good arrangement. Well, but then you get all the benefits of loving someone. Yeah. You get all the benefits of being loved. Yeah. But, but couldn't I just control you like a little bit when it's really important? No. And most of us never really come to terms with that. Some of us get closer than others. Um, my mother, you know, with whom I had a very close relationship, she would get nervous the more successful I got. So I would fly around and lecture in these different places and go to unusual country. Well, not unusual, go to countries with which she was not familiar. That sounds better, doesn't it? 
Um, and she would get nervous. She would get nervous. And she would say, you know, I get nervous when you travel to, to Ukraine. I get nervous when you travel to, uh, uh, to China. Back in those days when nobody went to China. I get nervous when you go to, to this place or that place. <laughs> I get nervous when you go to Alabama, which for most of us in America is kind of like going to China. Um, and I would say, yeah, I, I understand that you get nervous. And she would say, well, won't you please not do that? And I would say, no, I'm not going to not do that. And she'd say, well, don't you care that I'm in so much uh, distress about this? And I'd say, Ma, I love you until the end of time. I do care about your distress. I'm just not willing to do anything to take it away. So she really wished, not in a, to control me, but not in a bad way, in a loving way, and um, but at the same time, you know, we want our kids to to thrive and to have independence and all of that. Um, so I, I think the sense of powerlessness that we have now, it's not that unusual. It's just that we're more aware of it. And we think the stakes are so much higher now. The stakes are higher in the real world, but emotionally, the stakes are exactly the same, which is. Um, I love you so much. Can I tell you what to do when something is really important to me? Yeah, I think that the that the coronavirus or COVID-19 is helping a lot of people, whether or not they like it, they're being dragged into dealing with the realities of life and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, autonomy issues, powerlessness, and, and just really how people, human beings work, that at the end of the day, people have the right to self-determinate. <laughs> and love is not going to stop people from doing that. No. So, so, so I, think, I think that thinking about, you know, the autonomy, and as you mentioned at the beginning, is thinking about the decision you're going to make. And it's often what we're talking about with our clients is at the end of the day, you have to make the deep internal decision about what are you going to do or what are you going to decide to control or what are you going to accept that you can't control? And um, some people will say, well, how, how, how do you do that? And, and there's really no how, you just have to, it's again, facing life and facing this is, this, is, this is the truth and then you make the decision and you'll figure out the how, which is often dealing with the feelings. Yes, it's dealing with the feelings. It's not taking it personally. I mean, I know that nobody, really thinks that the virus is like aimed at them personally. Uh, but but um, there's a lot of people who are wrestling with, um, there's got to be something that I can do to sort of trick this thing. There must be something that I can do to like be accepted, uh, ex uh, to, to make an exception that I'm not going to be touched by this. And um, you know, everybody's looking for some sort of trick about something. Now with the virus, a lot of people are thinking uh, there must be some trick that I'm overlooking or um, why does everything have to happen to me? <laughs> why does everything have to happen, have to happen to me? And, you know, what, you're a therapist just like I am. And, and when we say to people, you know, Let's talk about the structure of real life here. There's kind of rules about how human beings work, and there's rules about how the world works. You know, if you keep your agreements with people, mostly they'll keep their agreements. If you break your promises, generally somebody is going to complain about that. I mean, these are rules that we've learned about how people operate. And, and learning to accept things that you can't control that's an important skill. It's, it's not, oh, you're lucky that you know how to do that. It's an important skill. And how do you do that is you, ex you begin to accept something you don't like, and then you, you be willing to feel the anguish. I used to play tennis three times a week for 25 years, and then I had knee troubles, and the doctor said, you can't play tennis anymore. And so like any reasonable person, I got angry at the doctor. <laughs> How dare you ruin my life, you know? Um, so for me, um, it took me 
it took me about a year to accept that I wasn't going to play tennis anymore. I held on to my tennis rackets. Um, I held on to them in the closet for about five years, about five years. During that first year, I couldn't, I couldn't watch anybody play tennis down the street. I couldn't watch tennis on TV. During that year, um, when patients would call me and say, is your office wheelchair accessible? I would say no, even though it is. I would say no because I didn't want to look at anybody in a wheelchair you know, from, from nine feet away for an hour every single week. So it took me a year. What I had to do was little by little feel the pain. And what was the pain like? I'll tell you what the pain was like. Number one, um, I'm losing something that I treasure. Number two, I'm getting old and that's terrible. Number three, why does this have to happen to me? Why can't it happen to somebody else? <laughs> Number four, um, these are no particular order. Number four, um, oh my gosh, if I could lose this, what else might I lose? Am I going to lose my eyesight next? You know, what, what else am I going to lose? So th this is the kind of pain that a normal human being would feel in this kind of a situation. And it's our desire to avoid feeling that pain that makes it difficult to accept things that we can't change. And then we just sort of limp along in, a, in an experience of temporariness and an expensive, experience of bitterness and an experience of frustration that we can't change this, we can't change this, we can't change this. I mean, I wasn't happy about losing tennis, but losing tennis is very small compared to feeling frustrated and humiliated that I couldn't change it, I couldn't figure a way around it for the rest of my life. So the same thing with this virus, for people to really accept, you know, my mom is gonna do what my mom is gonna do. I, I do my absolute best to persuade her, and then my mom's gonna do what my mom's gonna do. For somebody to accept that, they'd have to be willing to feel afraid. They'd have to be willing to feel powerless. They'd have to be willing to feel, I failed to do my duty as a good daughter, let's say. Um, they'd have to be willing to deal with anger. You know, I'm angry with you that you're putting, mom, that you're putting yourself at risk. So if, if you want the comfort that comes with accepting, I did my best and now my mom's going to do what my mom's going to do. You have to be willing to feel bad. You deal with those feelings. You resolve them. You get on with the rest of your life. You hope your mom will be okay. And you wait and see what happens. I think that's really wonderful what you shared about the process of acceptance. Like in the example you talked about tennis of taking five years um, and that you have to feel the pain. Uh, because I think a lot of people come in, they're like, okay, I accept. Now now what? <laughs> <laughs> now what? Now what? <laughs> yeah. Again, they're trying to get around. And I think, again, what right. you're talking about is that this is life. There, there are no shortcuts. And the, the shortcuts that people try and create to not feel the feelings that they need to feel in order to accept create more problems and drive them into our offices because... Absolutely. Absolutely true. Everybody wants, they think as therapists, we can provide them a shortcut so they don't have to feel those feelings. But in fact, what we do is we help people feel those feelings <laughs> and make sense of them so that they can move on. It's a funny thing. In some ways, people come in wanting one thing and we say, I got a better idea. Let me give you the exact opposite of what you came here for. <laughs> Trust me, you'll be glad after it's over. <laughs> And then we have to see. I hope we have enough time. I, I wanted just to, to kind of summarize all this up because, you know, um, you know, I've always heard this saying, and I don't know if you've heard it, they always would say, you have nothing if you don't have your mental, uh, you have nothing if you don't have your health. And I, as I modify this as saying, you don't have anything if you don't have your health and mental health. And a lot of people bat that term around, um, you know, and this is, this is for laymen. Uh, not non-therapists. I was wondering if you would mind qualifying that in your own opinion. What do you consider mental health? Um, and why do you think now it's really important to have that? I think of mental health as a set of skills 
that you have in your, in your briefcase or your toolkit, a set of skills, knowing how to deal with conflict, knowing how to deal with disappointment, knowing how to express anger in a reasonable way, knowing when to not take something personally, um, having empathy, um, stuff like that. So I think of mental health as having um, a set of skills. And you never know which one of those skills you're gonna to need tomorrow. What we know is that there's a bunch of skills that if you're an adult for 25 years, you're gonna need every single one of those skills. We just don't know when. You never know when the person you love the most is gonna get hit by a truck. You're gonna need certain skills that you didn't need yesterday, certain emotional skills. So I think of mental health as a set of skills that people can access, that people can access when they need them. That's wonderful. That, um, did you wanna add something? I do wanna add something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And why do people need that, especially now? I'll give you one, one version of that. Um, I have a certain number of patients now who are thinking that, okay, this is a temporary little situation and we're gonna get back to normal pretty soon and then I can deal with everything that I need to deal with. But right now, I'm just gonna kind of like try and hold my breath and just try and get through this. And I think this is real life right now. This is not um, a temporary aberration, although we hope that the situation right now changes as soon as possible. But in terms of the need for good conflict resolution skills, the need to know how to listen, the need to be empathic, the need to not take things personally, all that, that has not changed the ability to love without trying to control somebody. All those aspects of mental health, all those relationship skills, all the self-care skills, um, the need for those things hasn't changed. So we need mental health now just as much as we needed it before this and just as much as we're going to need it afterwards. And we need the same things. We need that skill set because right now this is real life. This is not a timeout. This is real life right now. I think that's really important that, yeah, what, what therapy and mental health provides is the ability to deal with real life, to deal with life. And um, that's always the challenge uh, when we have crises. You even, need to, <laughs> you even need those skills more because it, you can get consumed with feelings that make it hard for you to, to see things accurately. So having those tools to, to self-soothe, to be self-reflective, to identify a feeling from a fact are really important. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Klein, for stopping today and helping us with the World For You uh, endeavor that we're doing to give people, you know, reaching out and, and connecting and helping them deal with this difficult time. I really, really appreciate it so much. Tammy, it's my privilege to contribute to this project, and it's nice to hang out with you for 45 minutes today. Yes, thank you so much. Bye, Dr. Klein. Bye-bye.